good to have you with us at this hour. I'm Daniel Che, and let's start with the headlines. Korea continues to battle the MERS outbreak. Efforts to contain the virus include ensuring that people abide by safety protocols and advising medical workers who treat MERS patients to wear protective clothing. The vacuum at the second highest government post is finally filled in Korea as President Park Geun-hye formally appoints incoming Prime Minister Hwang Kyo-won. Korean financial officials say the U.S. Federal Reserve's key interest rate freeze was expected and will only have a limited impact on the nation's financial sector. Let's begin with the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS situation here in Korea. For the details, we go straight to our Kim ji who joins us at the News Center. ji can you fill us in on the latest? Well, Daniel, just a few hours ago, the Director General of the World Health Organization, Margaret Chan, held a news conference in Seoul at the start of her three-day visit to the country. During the event, she gave her assessment of the MERS situation in Korea. Take a look. Our current assessment of the MERS situation in this country is the government is now on a very good footing. The response of the health authority has been exemplary. Well, you may say that at the beginning it was a slow start, but that slow start was followed by world-class epidemiological detective work. The country's highly developed IT capabilities allow real-time tracking of spread and reporting of findings. The response in this country has been strengthened very quickly, systematically, and very significantly. And I can say, very few other countries in the world can do this. Well, she did say the response has been exemplary. That's certainly very encouraging, ji uh, But of course, what the world and Korea would like to know is when we will be able to declare Korea MERS-free. Well, Daniel, local experts say that it normally takes 28 days with no new cases after the last patient, which is the same standard used by the WHO in the case of Ebola. But what's disturbing now is the rising number of MERS cases in Korea among medical workers. At least two medical workers from Samsung Medical Center in southern Seoul have tested positive for MERS. And it's disturbing because not only are they exposed to the deadly virus, but they could be the ones spreading it because they see so many patients. The health ministry say the two medical workers contracted the virus due to a lack of adequate protective equipment and health authorities currently advise medical workers who are t treating MERS patients to wear level D protective clothing which requires coveralls and chemical resistant boots while gloves, safety glasses, escape masks and face shields are optional. You can see the comparison there with level C protective clothing which is the government which the government provided for medical workers to fight Ebola in Africa. And we've since learned that the medical workers at the Samsung Medical Center were given level D protective equipment on Wednesday, a couple weeks after the first outbreak. The ministry's MERS headquarters says that going forward, it will require all medical workers at the hospital to be tested to prevent new infections. Well, we all have to be vigilant in this trying time, particularly those that are showing symptoms of the MERS virus. What should they be doing, Jian? Well, they obviously should be following protocol to help contain the virus, and they should understand that their actions can really have serious consequences at this critical stage in the outbreak. And the case in point, patient 141 is believed to have contracted the virus after taking his father to Samsung Medical Center late last month. He tested positive for MERS on the 13th, five days after returning from a trip to the southernmost island of Jeju from June 5th to the 8th with eight other people, including his wife and son. The 42-year-old said he spent a lot of time in his car during the trip because he felt sick. And health authorities have tracked down at least 34 people who may have been in contact with the man and have taken steps to disinfect the hotel where he stayed. And in addition, he was sitting in business class on Korean Air flight KE-1. 223 on June 5th, 14 passengers and eight airplane personnel have already been placed in isolation at their homes, and more could be as well pending further investigation by the authorities. Back to you, Daniel. 
Well, thank you so much for that report, Chian. Staying on the topic of MERS situation here in Korea, businesses hit with plummeting revenue because of the outbreak will be able to file for low interest loans starting next month. The Bank of Korea announced today it will provide 587 million U.S. dollars for loans to local businesses at an interest rate of 0.75 percent. That's half the current benchmark interest rate. Companies eligible for the loans include those in the tourism, medical and education sectors. This follows the preemptive measure taken by the central bank last week when it cut its rate to an all-time low of 1.5 percent. With no end in sight to the MERS outbreak in Korea at the moment, the number of people under quarantine has topped 6,000 and it's growing. With so many people under strict instructions to stay home, it's proving virtually impossible to keep tabs on everyone. Our Handan reports on whether tougher measures need to be introduced. A middle-aged woman suspected of carrying the MERS virus is forcibly sent back home after being spotted walking on the streets. A man in his 30s, also a high-risk patient, is dragged off a tour boat he boarded in Incheon. Another suspected patient, who later tested positive for MERS, leaves an isolation ward and wanders around the hospital. As the struggle to contain the MERS outbreak goes on longer than most had expected, the authorities are having a hard time ensuring each suspected patient stays under quarantine. Currently, health officials send out postal notices and make phone calls to those believed to have had any kind of contact with MERS patients. They're ordered to stay at home or at designated medical facilities, depending on the degree of risk. Officials also inform them that if they break quarantine regulations, they'll be fined 2,700 U.S. dollars. But with the number of infections still ticking up, many are asking if the preventive measure is strong enough. A $2,700 fine is a bit weak as a tool to protect the lives and safety of the people as well as the public interest. Some argue more pragmatic support that eases the inconvenience of staying home all day is needed to stop them venturing outside. I don't think the size of the fine is the problem. It's more important to come up with realistic measures to ensure they stick to the rules. More than 6,700 people are in quarantine across the nation with the number growing fast. Experts say that one way or the other, it's time for the government to draw up more effective measures to tighten surveillance. Han Daun, Arirang News. In politics, after days of tough negotiations and heated debates, Korean lawmakers have voted in favor of confirming Hwang kyo won as prime minister. With that, the post has finally been filled after a vacancy of nearly two months. Our National Assembly correspondent Park ji won tells us more. The confirmation process wrapped up on Thursday morning with 156 votes in favor of Hwang kyo won 120 against and two invalidated. Before the vote was called, lawmakers from the two main rival parties took the opportunity to make one final appeal for their positions. It's not the role of the opposition parties to just blindly refuse the president's choice of personnel. We need a more fair and objective perspective for vetting the nominee. Today, I hope you cast a vote of yes, considering the nominee's capabilities and qualifications. Are you voting yes because Hwang kyo an is the right person to assume the post of prime minister? Or is it because the incumbent administration cannot find another alternative? And the political blow will be huge if he is voted down. The vote follows days of fierce debate over Hwang, centered around a string of allegations against him. On Thursday, opposition party lawmakers decided to set their objections to Hwang aside, end the debate and participate in the vote. The party was apparently concerned about the public response to the ongoing debate, worrying that people would feel that they were interfering too much in state affairs, especially amid the MERS outbreak. Opposition lawmakers are, however, planning to ask the new prime minister for an apology during the assembly's four-day interpolation session, which starts Friday. They also hope to resolve some of the remaining questions about the allegations against him. Park ji Arirang News. Moving on to a revision to a parliamentary law in Korea. If that law is vetoed by President Park Geun-hye, the National Assembly will likely put it up for a vote again, barring any disagreements between the two main rival parties. The remarks were made by Assembly Speaker Jung Il-hwa Thursday. 
Under the Constitution, lawmakers can vote again on a law that's been vetoed by the president. A two-thirds majority is needed to override the veto, or the law is scrapped. If the president does veto the measure, it's likely to further strain relations between her and the parliament, particularly with her own Senri party. President Baca said the law is unconstitutional because it gives parliament the power to make changes to administrative ordinances, which she says violates the separation of powers. Korea's presidential office says it's unlikely the leaders of Korea and Japan will attend upcoming ceremonies to mark the 50th anniversary of the two countries' normalized ties. President Park Geun-hye's spokesperson said President Park and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe are not expected to attend receptions hosted by each other's embassies on June 22nd. Instead, the two leaders are expected to send personal messages. As per a Japanese media report, Fukushiro Nukaga, Nukaga, that is the chairman of the Japan-Korea Parliamentarians Union, will attend the event in Seoul as Prime Minister Abe's special envoy. The spokesperson said it's possible, but he cannot confirm whether Nukaga will pay a courtesy call to President Park. It appears North Korea's top diplomat visited China with no prior notice. According to Seoul's Yonhap News Agency, North Korean Foreign Minister Lee Su-yong was seen leaving the Beijing Capital International Airport by a Japanese reporter on Thursday. The reason for his visits remain unknown. An official at Seoul's Foreign Ministry said that since Lee is scheduled to be in Africa next week, it's likely that he is just transferring between flights in Beijing. North Korea has been extending its diplomacy to Africa to counter international sanctions related to its human rights record. The U.S. Federal Reserve has opted to keep its key interest rate frozen for now, but says it is committed to raising the rate before the end of the year. As the decision was expected, most analysts seem to believe it will have little impact on Korea, at least for now. Our Kwon Soa reports. The U.S. Federal Reserve has decided to keep its key interest rate steady again at near zero. But it did signal a possible rate hike, citing an improving economy that's on track to grow between 1.8 and 2 percent this year. The committee continues to judge that the first increase in the federal funds rate will be appropriate when it is seen further improvement in the labor market and is reasonably confident that inflation will move back to its 2 percent objective over the medium term. Fed Chairwoman Janet Yellen said no decision had been made about the exact timing of an increase, but analysts already have their expectations. But I'd still put the probability of them going in September at, at 60, 60 percent or higher. In Korea, the news of Wednesday's freeze did not come as a big surprise, as it was similar to the country's market expectations. That's why local experts say it will have a limited impact on the financial sector in the short term, but that Korea will have to be prepared for the second half of the year. As Korea has cut its key interest rate, we could say we are moving on a different economic cycle than the U.S. Now, Korea's central bank will have to decide whether to follow a rise in global rates. The Korean government cautioned against the impact of higher U.S. interest rates, saying it could lead to some capital outflow, but that it would be a positive sign for local exporters. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Some exciting news for Korea. Korean automakers Hyundai Motor and Kia Motors have, rec have scored rather top marks in an American survey of new vehicle quality. They're leading the industry by the widest margin ever. According to U.S. researcher J.D. Power's initial vehicle quality study released on Wednesday, Korean brands recorded a rate of 90 problems per 100 vehicles from model year 2015, a marked improvement from last year. European brands, meanwhile, stood at 113, and Japanese and Americans, 114. Kia Motors, which ranked second only to Porsche, led all non-premium brands for the first time in the study's history. Japanese automakers, long known for their quality, fell below the industry average for the first time in almost 30 years. Now, experts say there has been a clear shift in the quality landscape with Korean brands accelerating way past their international rivals. And it's official. The city of Seoul will raise its public transit fares later this month. 
The city announced today that its proposed fare hikes has passed the city council. So starting next Saturday on June 27th, subway fares in the capital will go up 20 cents, while bus fares will rise by 15 cents. The fare hike will only apply to tickets for adults, and the plan is part of the city's efforts to fight deflation. The last fare hike in Seoul was in February 2012. That's all from me. More at 10 p.m. Korea time. Join us then. For now, thank you for watching.